Spark Books here. Today, I'm going to explain the book, Leadership is Language, by David Marquette. Take care, enjoy the book, and have a nice day. Leadership is Language, 2020, is a playbook for successful team management. Written by a former U.S. Navy captain, it teaches leaders how they can change their language and mindsets in order to improve decision-making, empower workers, and achieve better results. Key idea number one, traditional management divides individuals into deciders and doers. Imagine working, days finished, you're leaving, join some friends at a neighboring bar. You might benefit from a gym workout. You're fatigued, resting at home sounds good. Before choosing, you pause, you pack, leave, and execute your strategy. You did and thought, after considering your destination, you went. You choose between these modes daily and private. All do, most workers are either thinkers or doers. Most companies follow industrial age models. Key point, traditional management divides individuals into deciders and doers. Leaders and followers, salaried and hourly, white collar and blue collar, have developed different descriptions and signals over time. The main arbitrary difference? One group decides, the other executes. Taylor's 1911 book The Principles of Scientific Management illustrates this approach. Taylor defines the most effective manner for steel mill workers to conduct various duties. When shoveling 21 pounds, the average worker was most efficient. 21, 21, Taylor found reducing variability increased efficiency. That made sense then, standardization was essential in production. Companies still benefit from reducing variability. For mass-producing autos, companies must rapidly build millions of similar parts. McDonald's must serve consistent burgers to satisfy customers. However, humans vary. We're not doers or thinkers. Taylor's scientific management requires updating. Key idea number two, the old leadership language is deterministic and binary, all about doing, not thinking. Bahamas tragedy on October 1, 2015. El Faro, a container ship, sank in a hurricane. 33 crew members died. The captain could be faulted for not avoiding the storm, the first mate for not alerting the captain to changing weather, or the bridge team for not alerting the first mate about the worsening waves. However, the author believed language was the issue. The terminology used on board the El Faro and in the corporation that owned it was antiquated, a relic from an old leadership style that had catastrophic implications. The previous leadership strategy is predictable and binary, focused on doing rather than thinking. Let's examine the captain's pre-accident remarks. He reassured them, we'll be all right. He mocked inexperienced seamen who changed course for every single weather pattern. No, no, he said, we won't turn. The captain was presumably encouraging his crew. He made it harder for lower ranking people to voice their concerns. The captain's language of invulnerability and invincibility is a legacy of the industrial age, when leaders had to persuade followers. Its goal-oriented language reduces unpredictability and anticipates problems. It asks binary, deterministic questions. Are you sure? Binary questions require yes or no answers. How sure are you? Is more vague, thought-provoking, it lags. Imagine Al Faro's captain taking a different approach. Instead of informing his staff, we're not going to turn around. What if he had asked everyone to participate in decision-making? What if he had pulled the team on their route confidence? Possibly, he may have saved El Faro and its passengers. Key idea number three, modern firms can't use the traditional leadership style. Another aquatic tragedy. In April 2010, Deepwater Horizon oil rig monitor showed unsafe drilling riser pressure. Bridge operators closed drilling with temporary seals but did not use the emergency disconnect switch, which prevents blowouts. The rig burned after 9 minutes of hydrocarbon emissions. 5 million barrels of oil poured into the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11. What happened? An examination revealed that bridge operators were waiting for manager approval. Consider, combustible hydrocarbon spurted from an oil rig's wellhead for 9 minutes while bridge operators awaited authorization to stop the blowout. How can someone fear touching a button without authorization more than a massive explosion? The takeaway, modern firms need a new leadership style. As we saw, one group of workers made decisions while the other implemented them in the traditional method. Leaders had to convince individuals to comply to run procedures. In the industrial age, standardization and efficiency were valued, but not always now. Today, adaptability is as crucial as efficiency. Traditional industries move faster now. Consider car manufacture. Cars internal combustion engines were invented in 1859, over 100 years after the steam engine. The first car was manufactured 27 years later, and Ford's Model T, the first middle-class car, took 22 more. Innovation now takes months, not centuries. Companies must adapt swiftly. Remember El Faro, the captain had many chances to reverse course, but his leadership style didn't allow for re-evaluation. 
it didn't encourage team members to voice issues either. Result, everyone was stuck in a restricted mode of action that prevented them from adapting. Key idea number four, organizations thrive when doers also decide. Francis Galton attended a rural fair in 1906. One stand offered an ox to the closest guesser. Galton examined the votes after the match. He observed that the average guess was closer to the real figure than all but a few individual guesses. The group knew more than most fairgoers. Organizations thrive when doers are also deciders. In his steel mill study, Taylor showed that reduced variability improves work. Think submarine operator, she should presumably follow protocol. Close the hatch first, submerge it, avoid deviating from the sequence. Variability helps thinking work. You want lots of ideas when brainstorming. You appreciate options when making decisions. Good leaders reject the old divide between deciders and doers and involve everyone in decision making. They agree with Galton that the wisdom of many is usually greater than that of one. This technique boosts motivation and variability. Autonomy at work reduces burnout and makes workers happier. One Harvard Business School study highlighted flexibility in determining what to do or how to complete the goal as the top factor encouraging creativity in firms. Smart leaders recognize that involving everyone in thinking work is the greatest way to get results, or guess an ox's weight. We'll discuss methods in the next blink. Key idea number five, leaders utilize language that fosters participation. CEOs have lunch with old friends. His day is special. His company is field testing a novel product that might reap big rewards. His project lead, who is monitoring the trial, calls him at lunch. Not well, tell me if you need me to come over, he concludes. The CEO is having lunch with leadership as language author, who is worried by this conversation. He recommends his pal call the project lead and restate his sign off. CEOs do that. How useful would it be if I came to the site? He says, five, the CEO rises, thanks his friend, and heads over. Key point, leaders utilize language that fosters participation. The CEO subconsciously adopted his old leadership style in his first sign off. I command, my employee obeys. Tell me if you need me as a command. The project lead must acknowledge she needs support and ask her supervisor to leave lunch. Doing that is hard. Reformulating changed everything. How helpful would it be if I came over? Requests information. He wants to know what the project lead thinks with this open-ended, non-binary query. Rephrasing allowed her to provide him the information he required for the product test. Organizational success requires psychological safety. It's developed by deliberately encouraging unpleasant perspectives and requesting opinion, as shown below. Leaders can employ several methods. To encourage others to speak, they can speak less. They might confess their ignorance to help others. Vulnerability makes it easier for people to speak up. Imagine if the Deepwater Horizon operators had felt secure to flick the switch. If Al Faro's bridge crew felt safe enough to communicate weather concerns. Key idea number six. Successful leaders control the clock rather than obey it. Imagine Al Faro's crew felt safe enough to challenge the captain's judgment. Before departing, the captain met with his first mate. I'm excited you're on the team, he told her. Our age and gender variances may give us distinct viewpoints. I welcome your thoughts and will listen. He convened many all-crew meetings at important points during the next two days to propose shifting routes. He used language and methods to involve everyone in decision-making. He took breaks to rethink his path instead of simply following it. He controlled the clock. Key point, successful leaders control the clock rather than obey it. Controlling the clock requires switching between thinking and action, even if it means slowing down or rethinking decisions. The earlier obey the clock technique avoided pauses. In a manufacturing, idle time is wasted. The old methods language keeps teams doing. The El Faro commander encouraged his men to tough it out. You can't run every weather pattern. Thus, we'll keep on now. His staff didn't feel comfortable raising concerns. Who wants to flee rain? Leaders encourage, plan, and name pauses. Instead of we need to reach landfall by Friday, they remark, I'm a bit anxious about the storm. We're heading out, but we'll hold a team meeting at noon to reconsider that decision. They save lives by helping their teams adapt to shifting conditions. Key idea number seven, effective leaders celebrate variation and flexibility and collaborate on decisions. The author leads a leadership program for worldwide company executives. He gives groups an assignment. Each group gets 90 seconds to make an educated guess regarding an experiment the author just described. At every table, a senior executive guesses first. Others think higher or lower. Everyone then decides. Result? No matter how off their original guess was, each group's final estimate is always close. Effective leaders value diversity and flexibility and collaborate on decisions. 
As we saw, traditional leadership was forceful. It required people to follow decisions they didn't make. Many leaders today recognize the value of incorporating everyone in decision-making but lack the skills to do it. Leaders must modify their language and approach to go from coercion to collaboration. Before discussing, executives at the leadership seminar may have put down their guesses anonymously. This would have allowed quieter group members to speak up, increase the diversity of first predictions, and shielded everyone from the senior executive. Asking thoughtful, inquisitive questions is another way to encourage diversity. What would happen if you asked, what am I missing? Instead of does it make sense? Instead of gently encouraging consensus, invite dissent. The author's employer starts meetings by picking a card from a deck of 80% black and 20% red. Red cards force dissent and provide psychological safety. As we'll see in the following blink, your efforts resulted in more ideas and a more motivated team. Key idea number 8, leaders inspire action rather than compliance. January 1st, late afternoon, you committed to give up sugar for a month last night, but today you're exhausted, hungover, and extremely tempted to raid the pantry for sweets. No sugar. It repeats, I can't eat sugar. You don't realize that telling yourself you don't eat sugar is more effective. Can't implies an external force preventing sugar consumption. However, don't empowers you. You won't raid the cupboard because you don't eat sweets. Intrinsic motivation drives behavior better than external pressure. Key point, leaders inspire action rather than compliance. Compliance is easy. We work much more enthusiastically and effectively because we're excited to see what we may discover. We also handle failures and setbacks more easily. They're part of the learning process. After all, commitment, however, motivates. Learning instead of doing can get commitment. The traditional playbook encourages people to prove themselves and their products. But humans are far more effective when they have an improved mindset. Like all mammals, we're curious. Our brains are hardwired to react positively to exploration and discovery. Psychologists call this the seeking system. When we engage in work with the goal of learning something new, we activate this system. Another way to encourage commitment is to divide work into chunks. When people know a pause has been planned for the near future, a moment to check in and reevaluate, they're much more willing to throw themselves into work full on. Breaking work into chunks has the added benefit of protecting against an escalation of commitment, whereby pledges to a certain course of action reinforce themselves and become impossible to rescind. Think what might have happened had the El Faro crew broken up its journey into smaller chunks of decision-making and execution. Rather than the captain making one decision at the beginning of the journey, we will take this route, and we will not deviate, the crew would have met periodically on board to reevaluate. Key idea number 9, successful leaders complete defined goals instead of continuing work indefinitely. Toward the end of the 2017 Academy Awards, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway walked on stage to announce the Best Picture winner. When Beatty opened the envelope, he found a card that said, Emma Stone, La La Land, and, in smaller print at the bottom, actress in a leading role. It wasn't the card for Best Picture at all. We all know what happened next, Dunaway announced the wrong winner, the producers of La La Land came on stage to accept the award, and it wasn't until minutes later that one of them interrupted the celebrations to announce Moonlight as the real winner. Why didn't Beatty or Dunaway say something when they saw they had the wrong card? Because they were stuck in an outdated mindset, keep on going, don't hold things up, continue at all costs. This is the key message, successful leaders complete defined goals instead of continuing work indefinitely. In the industrial age, leaders sought to maximize the time their team spent in production work. Work proceeded indefinitely, without operational pauses. The clock was obeyed, and barriers were erected to avoid interruptions. Workers were primed never to think, only to do, so that production never slowed. That's the mindset Beatty and Dunaway were stuck in when they walked on stage. They both knew something was wrong. When Beatty opened the envelope, he did a double take. His face tightened with confusion as he searched for a second card. Dunaway stared at him expectantly. The clock was ticking, and the silence was awkward. Beatty looked off stage for help, some sign of what to do. You're impossible, Dunaway said, exasperated. Commande Beatty showed her the card, and she immediately called out La La Land. Imagine if, instead, they'd felt empowered to stop the show and double-check the winner, maybe charming the audience with a joke to keep them entertained. That would have meant chucking the industrial age playbook in favor of one that encourages pauses for reflection. How can leaders encourage that kind of approach? By thinking of projects not as endlessly ongoing, but as a series of discrete steps that can be completed and celebrated. Studies have shown that pausing to acknowledge and enjoy a completion actually improves people's workplace performance. It also creates space for re-evaluation and reflection. Maybe if Beatty and Dunaway had had that kind of space, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences could have avoided the worst fiasco in its history. 
Key idea number 10, successful leaders encourage people to learn, grow, and improve. You've probably heard of the Disney movie Frozen, even if you haven't seen it. It grossed over a billion dollars, after all, and won tons of prestigious film awards. What you probably don't know, though, is that an early version of the film was a total flop. At a test screening held 18 months before the planned release date, viewers were unsparing in their criticism and dislike. A producer using the old playbook might have focused on everything that went wrong, reminding his team how little time they had left to get their act together. But instead of focusing on failures, Frozen's producer focused on opportunities. I want you to envision your biggest hopes, he told his team. If we could do anything, what would you want to see on the screen? The key message here is, successful leaders encourage people to learn, grow, and improve. Instead of pressuring his team to prove their ability, the producer invited them to improve their outcome. He gave them permission to let go of any ties they had to the existing work and let their imaginations run wild. Result? Team members felt confident about throwing radically new ideas into the mix. They could reimagine the film in totally fresh and surprising ways, without worrying about how it would affect the production schedule. The concept of improve and learn is nothing new. Industrial age companies were constantly analyzing their processes in an effort to tweak, streamline, or perfect them. But back then, only leaders were responsible for this type of work. It was their job to observe and judge workers and decide how they could improve. Today, in a world that privileges greater collaboration, it's up to everyone on the team to evaluate themselves. In order to facilitate this, effective leaders need to create cultures that are psychologically safe. Most people are afraid of being perceived as ignorant or incompetent. This keeps them in approve, rather than improve, mindset. But no one is served when people feel threatened and become defensive. Instead, we want them to feel empowered to make things better. If Frozen's success teaches us anything, it's that when people are empowered to learn, committed to act, and included in decisions about their own work, there's no limit to what they can achieve. If you're a leader, the language you use is probably inherited from the industrial age, when people were divided into strict categories, deciders and doers, leaders and followers, decision makers and decision executors. Today, the most successful organizations reject that division, including all team members in both thinking work and doing work. To achieve that end, leaders need to rethink radically the language they use to communicate. To view more content like this, subscribe. Don't forget to like and turn on notifications. The channel really benefits from it. I appreciate you being here.